Welcome to the show, All Things Writing. I am your host, Brian the Writer. Let me take you on a journey through my writing life and introduce you to some of the amazing talent that exists in the writing world. Whether you're looking for a little advice or just to catch an interesting interview, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All Things Writing starts now. Hey everyone, welcome to All Things Writing. I'm your host, Brian the Writer. Uh, I want to start off this interview today by asking a simple question. What did the words gilded age mean to you? I think it conjures up a lot of imagery in people's minds. Things like these big dresses that the women wore and um, the the men with the, the very dapper look and the top hats and they would go out for you know, drinks before dinner, that kind of things, uh, those kinds of things. A little steampunk-ish, honestly. You think of big locomotives, right, crossing this great country. Things really, really changed uh, in that post-Civil War era because they had to rebuild everything. Uh, it, it is a fact that more Americans, and I consider Union and Confederate soldiers, they're both Americans, right? Um, something we forget sometimes is the, the tragedy on both sides was just immense. Uh, there were more deaths in the American Civil War than in uh, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam combined. That was a lot of war death. So coming out of that time period, people wanted something more. Now, that, that Gilded Age only takes place from about 1870 to 1900, Historians sort of agree on that, so the rough time period. Americans wanted something else in life, something a little different. So uh, in the 1900s, we're still not to like the Roaring Twenties, but things are starting to get a little bit better. What about the Gilded Age? Why is it an attractive time period for an author to work in? Well, that's actually the question we're going to answer uh, right now on All Things Writing, but we're also going to answer the question, okay, if I wanted a drink in 1880, uh, what would I be drinking and uh, how do I make it today? As I've mentioned in some of my videos, I do like a good old-fashioned, so um, maybe we can, we can talk about that a little bit, but who should we talk about that with? Oh, I know. I'll tell you what. Enter my next guest. Welcome to All Things Writing, Cecilia T.C., uh, good day, Cecilia. You. Hello, Brian. Hi. I, so uh, for, for those of you who have watched uh, any of my videos for, for any length of time, you know that sometimes we have technical problems, and that's just the way things work. So we had some technical problems at the beginning. I'm hoping we work them out, but either way, uh, it's all going to work out great. But before we get into anything, uh, Cecilia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a native of Steel City, Pittsburgh. Before it was wow. a football team, it had it had Mills grinding out Andrew Carnegie's uh, and then U.S. Steel's uh, rolled steel. The 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 tracks that American trains run on, I think, were milled in Pittsburgh. Now from Pittsburgh. Um, I, I spent some years as an adult teaching in Boston, but then Vanderbilt University, and that is such a Gilded Age name, Vanderbilt, that I feel I probably am fated to have started to work in the Gilded Age. <laughs> so that's from a titan from the Gilded Age itself, Andrew Carnegie, uh, to Commodore Vanderbilt, I'm afraid I'm locked in. Well, this, it's it's sort of funny and fortuitous that that we're having this conversation. Uh, I once owned a house in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Ah, so, okay. We know about that flood, and flood. we know why the flood. And that wasn't a natural disaster. Nope. That was um, an industrial accident of the first order. Yes, sir. The flood. Mm. Yep. Yep, that was a, uh, uh, I, I, I say it was a man-made accident of um, ignoring uh, the, the, the upkeep of the dam. So it was a... Exa of... Exactly right, exactly yeah. right. You know, there's, there is a kind of mantra I've understood in business to this day. It is 
externalize your costs. So maintaining that dam in Johnstown in that area would have been uh, something of an extra cost. Uh, and what it cost, of course, were lives and property, uh, and gave David McCullough his opportunity for his first best-selling book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, mm-hmm. I think um, uh, one of the one of the great things, if if anybody uh, uh, has the chance, go to the Johnstown Flood Museum. It's a very interesting place to go. Oh, oh. good tip. Yeah, they they even have on display a, a bottle of water uh, that somebody collected from the day. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Yeah. All right, road yeah. trip. <laughs> I I think so. I think so. Mm-hmm. I I actually stepped on. Uh, uh, I was on Andrew Carnegie's uh, rail car, personal rail car, which was Ooh. beautiful. Beautiful. Oh yeah. So, oh. Now we talked a little, and you mentioned it a little bit, but why specifically the Gilded Age? Well, interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting. About 25 years ago, I taught a course at Vanderbilt on the Gilded Age, and nobody was thinking of the Gilded Age. They thought industrial progress, labor issues, da da da. But Mark Twain's book title, The Gilded Age, has roared up to the present. Why? Because we are in a second Gilded Age. If one Googles, you find a mix of references from then, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and now. And there's a certain pairing that I find um, almost uncanny. Two eras of major technological change. So in the first Gilded Age, uh, the farms are giving way not only to the cities, but major industry. So the gears and girders are all new. Uh, the, The job situation, working in shifts on a time clock, that was all new. Uh, and people were were disrupted by it. And just as now, technology, this digital era we've got, we we haven't quite figured it out. And now we have AI coming on. Mm-hmm. Um, and further to pair the two Gilded Ages, in the first one, here were industrial titans, rich as used to be said, Croesus. Mm-hmm. There was there was Carnegie, there was Rockefeller, there was Henry Clay Frick, uh, there was this Copper King Clark, and they bought mansions, not just one, uh, all along Fifth Avenue. Um, and now we have, of course, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, um, the vast yachts then and now, um, and the problem of of wealth distribution so unequal mega gazillionaires and back then people barely scraping by and to this day people living in tents and i'm not talking about the tents uh this spring on college campuses in 2024 i mean living on sidewalks and public parks because they can't afford the cheapest apartment. And even though lots of the tent dwellers have jobs and they're working. So we have we have that. And uh, here's another dark part of, of the two Gilded Ages. Child labor in the first Gilded Age. And if you were affluent, you thought that uh, children working long hours, maybe grinding up sausages in, uh, in Chicago, uh, in, the, in, the, in the packing houses, mm-hmm. that that would somehow build character. And we find right now some members of Congress are supporting child labor laws that will enable 12 and 13-year-old kids to have paying jobs. So we're finding we've got these two Gilded Ages, and and Brian, uh, they're not completely the same, but the similarities are remarkable. And I think 
uh, to visit the first Gilded Age could give us some ideas about what we might need to do now because there were people farsighted in the first Gilded Age who foresaw, if you don't educate children, what's their, what's their life going to be, if not crime? Um, yeah. um, they need to do math. They need to have skills. They need to have read some books to know how people have thought about issues in human life. So um, uh, take a look, I would say, at that first Gilded Age and take a lesson and apply the lesson right now. So that's my, that's my uh, two-bit story on why this Gilded Age, and, and bearing in mind, um, credit to, to Mark Twain and his co-author, Charles D Dudley Warner, who was at the time a much better known author. They collaborated on this novel, The Gilded Age, A Tale of mm. Today. Um, gilded. No woman wants to be given a piece of jewelry to be told that it's only coated, glittering on the surface and underneath there is a base metal. Um, and that, of course, was, was Mark Twain's point. Um, shiny on the surfaces, diamonds, gold, um, all sorts of luxury, but underneath there's something base going on and we need to talk about it. And that novel does, let me quickly say, it's not a very good novel. It's all over the place. I don't, I don't, I'm not sending people right to, to pick it up. Yeah, we, 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 we do that as authors. I think a lot of times we'll make book recommendations and then there will be some things like, oh, that was a great book, but don't read it. It's not a good book. <laughs> well, well, I would say, you know, um, the requirement to read it might be for your master's degree or your doctoral exams. Uh, uh, but otherwise, if you're going to read some Mark Twain, um, uh, pick up some other titles. <laughs> well, um, I, I will say, you know, it's, and it's interesting uh, that you bring it up. I was thinking about, you know, when, when you look at... Uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX uh, as, as a good example of something that a, a revolutionary way that took uh, took space launching from uh, this this idea of oh it's just it's a government thing it's something that NASA does or something that, mm -hmm. to no wait a corporation can do this and by the way they can actually just do it better well and to to be honest most times anybody else can do anything better than the government can anyway but that's another story for another time um <laughs> but it's it's interesting to see how we have kind of rapidly jumped through the technology and if you consider the way trains were back in the day uh it wasn't a very big leap from uh steam locomotives to the big diesel locomotives that we had um it was a very interesting uh, leap, and it was very quick for that to happen. So technology is fascinating in uh, in in how it changes the world around us. It it, it is, and it does, and you know, uh, <laughs> even think of thinking of of of, of our talk today uh, that just would have been impossible not that long ago. And True. for a writer, you're a writer. I'm a writer. Um, I remember the days of carbon paper and the, and the mechanical typewriter, um, mm -hmm. clack, clack, clack. Uh, and, and it was just, it was a mess uh, and it was slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time I myself had a daisy wheel typing for me on my new computer and printer, I yeah. talk about miracle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course, we, we, we tend to normalize the new technologies so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first day, it was after a Thanksgiving holiday, and a student in my class had a new kind of phone. I said, is that the new iPhone? He said, yes, it is. I said, could I see it? 
<laughs> of course, pretty soon we've got them and and upgrading them and and what's new, Tim Cook? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have to show this. Um, I don't think I've ever shown this on the show, so this may be a first. But uh, I want to just turn the camera real quick, and uh, uh, you can see back there is my uh, Sterling Silver 1946 model uh, typewriter. Whoa. And I wish I wish I could uh, I, I wish I could get somebody uh, to fix it for me so that it would function again. It. Uh, I mean, it still does work uh, in terms of some of the keys, but I really do need somebody to to, to work it out for me. But I I love you know you, you mentioned the 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 different world we're in today compared to the, the people in the Gilded Age, which the writers and and the newspapermen and the the people writing magazines. Um, now you and I, when we send uh, something, when we've got a question for our editors, we don't stick it in the mail. Uh, we email it and we get a response back like in five minutes. That's um, right. It's That's fascinating right. to me. And 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 for that matter, you send off something you've written and it just you hit submit and there it goes. So the old days of blaming the U.S. Post Office for a manuscript not arriving. Nah, sorry, can't do that anymore. Yeah. Some places <laughs> don't even take it anymore in uh, paper form. They won't. Right. That's right. Like, now nah, we need a, we want a word document that we can deal with. Um, but now mm -hmm. you, I, I, I've read through all of the books you've written mm. and there was one thing that sort of hit me is uh, you, you wrote this book on the drinks mm. of the Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. And so you've obviously looked at recipes and different things like that. Uh were, was there something that, as you went through your research that you came across and you said, wow, I did not expect this? Um, I'm curious, what surprises you? What surprises me, maybe most of all, Brian, is that cocktails were inventions. Yeah. Um, that before the first Gilded Age... Uh, the idea of spirits, so mm. gin or um, or rye, scotch, bourbon, any of the whiskeys, mm -hmm. uh, the the idea, and it was for men, purity, straight from the bottle. Of course, uh, wines and 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 the brewery uh, that was a different matter, but it was purity. Anything in that drink, otherwise was an adulteration uh, of some sort, a corruption of some sort. Uh, and so purity of, of, of the whiskey or the gin was the idea. And watching your drink be poured straight from the bottle, and of course you hoped that the, that the uh, distiller had done it right, uh, but that was the idea. As far as anybody knows, um, the first pleasing adulteration was ice. Ice. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I have to say that's that shocks me. I it, I, it was <laughs> it shocked me. You see, this is what I'm saying that that cocktails were an invention. So, if we think along with Edison, and of course the elevators to this day that with plaques that say Otis, Mr. Otis, who invented a brake on a hoist so it wouldn't plunge to the earth, uh, the elevator, electricity, and on and on. The idea that whiskey and gin might not only welcome ice, but perhaps other pleasing um, additives, fruit juices, um, or consider this, bitters. Bitters is about oh, half yeah. alcohol. And it was sold as a medicine uh, in pharmacies. Mm -hmm. And in, in uh, New Orleans, 
um, a, uh, a pharmacist named Peisho, P-E-Y-C-H-A-U-D, was, was peddling his, his uh, bitters from a family recipe. Okay. And, and he found that his customers liked to mix a little of that bitters in some brandy or cognac. That was the beginning of the Sazerac cocktail. Um, now, <laughs> there is, just as there was an Edison of electricity and an Otis of the elevator, mm -hmm. there was a founding father of cocktails, and his name was Jerry Thomas. Okay. Connecticut lad whose parents hoped he would be called to the ministry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Boy, was the, that disappointing. That was, well, <laughs> to his parents at least. Um, and and uh, no one is quite sure when he started his cocktail revolution, but he published a book, a booklet really, with 10 cocktails, very basic. I mean, okay. barely understood to be what we would now call cocktails. But he tended bar uh, for a while in New York City, just down from the P.T. Barnum Museum. So you could go look at a, you know, at an Egyptian mummy and a whale's tooth. And then you could walk down the block and see this man beginning to experiment with mixtures. Uh, and the word cocktail and let me let me bring that in right now mm -hmm. uh, one always thinks of of uh, of a rooster uh, and however the better the better origin of the word has to do of all things with purebred horses and if we think oh. of the pure yep the purely distilled liquors, whiskeys, gins, pure. And we think of the thoroughbred, purebred, um, all, the, all the lineage well known and recorded in the stud book. Okay. But the animals that might look similar, even identical, but they were not purebred and they would be known by having their tails cut, cocked, they were the impure horses, and they could be in the same paddock with the thoroughbred, but you knew which was which by the look of the tails, even okay. if you weren't that good at judging horse flesh. Okay. So, okay. so transfer that term to cocktails, uh, and they became celebrated because they were, in a sense, not pure whiskey. They were flavored um, with sometimes uh, simple syrup uh, to make them sweeter, mm -hmm. the fruit juices and the fruit garnishes. Uh, and we can thank Mr. Carnegie and the railroads uh, for being able to bring tropical fruits into wintry climes. So one could have, let's say, um, a uh, an old-fashioned cocktail with orange bitters which, and which, a garnish. By the way, can I mm -hmm. just say, an old-fashioned, that's my jam. I love old-fashions. That's my favorite, too. Yeah. <laughs> the best, the best. Yep. Oh, you yep. bet. Yes. Um, and it looks so pretty, and it's, and it's there for sipping. Well, Jerry Thomas, after his, his 10 cocktail leaflet, uh, was a hit. Um, he published he published a second uh, much expanded book, uh, and in fact, I have a reprint here. It is called "How to Mix Drinks," or "The Bon Vivant's Companion," and you can buy a cheap reprint, which I which I have done. Uh, and he warns at the beginning. Cocktails are not for guzzling or no. quaffing. They're sippers to be enjoyed um, slowly and savored. Uh, and uh, all of the major bartenders, there was another man named Schmidt near the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, and he wrote a book. And he also 
uh, promoting temperance for those who can't hold their liquor. So these were these were bartenders who knew they were. Um, I hate to say trafficking in, um, but but that this was a new era of drinking for which they took responsibility uh, with guidelines as well as their recipes. So when I found, yeah, excuse me, I don't mean to sort of go on and on. No, no, but, I love it. Well, just to say my surprise was, by gosh, these were inventions. Mm -hmm. um, it was a big age of invention, that first, that first Gilded Age. And, you know, lately in these last few years, craft cocktails, um, uh, new bartenders, yeah. young people experimenting. So that fits too with can, our second. Can, I, can I just say, I love the fact that we, I heard this the other day and I, it, it about blew my mind. Um, a bartender called themselves, they were a true mixologist. The resurgence uh, of that word made me so happy. I like it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is maestros of the bar, yes, you know, yes. and and I would say also, um, in my in my reading, I found uh, typically a big city bartender was a showman, mm -hmm. uh, and watching him was uh, the audience lined up at the brass rail. Mm -hmm. He wore diamond cufflinks diamond shirt studs uh, and there were instructions on arranging the glassware, the fruit, how to hold uh, the mixing, you know, the mixing uh, jugs and sure. the mixing jars. And so, so he was performing while he was um, preparing to serve uh, uh, not, not as a waiter, but as a, maestro of his yeah. of the bar yeah yeah, yeah we and and uh, uh psa uh if you are out there drinking old fashions do not mm -hmm. gulp old fashions for one thing that is just a tasteless thing to do but for another thing that's two ounces of bourbon you're guzzling down you're only gonna be able to do that a few times and then you're gonna wonder where your shoes are so you know <laughs> Um, yeah, it's <laughs> word it to is, the wise. Yeah. Yes. You're going to wake up in a, in the next town over with your pants missing. So be, just be careful, <laughs> be careful. Um, now you, you actually sort of mentioned this a little bit and, uh, we sort of trend tend into this idea of etiquette and mm -hmm. I, I do love, uh, and, and I think we kind of miss a little bit in, in, in our current present age, this, a little bit of an etiquette, um, how how to necessarily treat each other and treat things and what is not done and what should be done. Um, what was your, you know, what is your favorite etiquette rule that I guess has been lost to antiquity? And if, if you could bring something back, what would it be? Well, I wouldn't bring back what I'm about to to say, although although uh, printers of business cards might benefit if it did come back. And here's what it what what it is. Uh, when manners evolved into etiquette, it was necessary for ladies and gentlemen to have calling cards, oh, yeah. calling cards, and at regular intervals, once a week, uh, there were designated afternoons for calling. So the lady, and this went into the middle classes as well, anybody who could, um, <laughs> could commandeer a carriage or even some, some might promenade um, if it was a lady with her maid or a friend because ladies did not solo um, on pedestrian walkways, yeah. but with the cards, um, uh, you would stop as a lady at the homes of your acquaintances as well as close friends. Uh, and you would present a card. The footman or the butler or a housekeeper would, would see you coming with your card. And the card had to be carried in a certain way. You didn't put your thumb on the face of the card. You carried it by its edges. And whoever received it either received it on a silver tray 
um, or if necessary, also by the edges. And the reason for the cards was to send the message that you thought about this person. Mm -hmm. This person was in your mind. Um, and perhaps your schedule did not permit you to pay an actual call to enter the, the home and spend 20 minutes of social conversation, but you wanted your acquaintance or friend to know that you cared, you were in there, in, in, you were thinking about them, and here was your card that proved it. So where they were like little personal documents, um, and and that that custom kept going until, for some people, in, into the 1920s. Now, uh, gentlemen had them as well. They had business cards, but they also had uh, social cards with their addresses. And on holidays, especially on New Year's Day, when businesses were closed, gentlemen would go from house to house and, and uh, leave their cards and sometimes go be invited into the house for a cup of punch. So it was cards for ladies and gentlemen and so that children learned their proper etiquette early. Children had cards too. And we're taught that that uh, sometimes they would be in the carriage, and they would be invited with their with their auntie or grandmother or their mother to step up and leave their card as well. Um, hmm. uh, and if there was no one at the door, there would be a basket or a, a sort of a silver. It might look like a a large planter. Okay. And there went the card. So it was proof that you had been there and you and you were thinking about these people. So it was a social social connective. L later, I think, Brian, the telephone um, took up a lot of that social uh, connection. Uh, the, the phone was initially thought of only as a, a business instrument. Uh, but once it became a you know, a commonplace in the household, and uh, people started calling their friends and acquaintances. And you didn't have to stay on the line a long time, but I think the the, the phone took over from the cards, but sure. it was those cards. Mm. Oh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> I am a, uh, I am a, a, I have a favorite gunfighter. Oh. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, um, Doctor uh, Doc Holliday, Dr. Doc Holliday, John, John Holliday was my, my is is my my the gunfighter that I most have been most interested in. I've read books on him. Uh, interesting mm. character. I visited uh, where his he's supposedly buried. They don't know exactly where, but they he's mm. somewhere in there. Uh, I actually saw a calling calling card from. Uh, uh, Dr. Holiday uh, on display, and it was one that he would have carried with him and presented. So it's fascinating. <laughs> and that was that was probably late 1800s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. So it's fun to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm kind of in awe of you to a certain extent because um, you write fiction and nonfiction as well, and I think those two things. I think it's a challenge to be able to write both and write both well, because uh, I, I almost feel like there's two different brains uh, when, when you do that, right? So is there, a, is there a big difference in how you're approaching those two different projects, I guess, for the well, other writers out there? Okay, let, let me first, Brian, come back at you that anybody can write mystery, horror, sci-fi. I couldn't begin to vary my genres. Yes, fiction, nonfiction. I would say here's what connects, for me, connects them. Okay. You have to tell a story. Sure. Um, and uh, there, there are two ideas uh, that I think relate to both fiction and nonfiction. And I've, and it's these don't, originate with me. Um, I heard them as guidelines uh, for really for doctoral students who are going to try to rewrite their dissertations. And one idea is 
consider that you are the host or hostess of a party and you are inviting a stranger into your party. The stranger comes in, you meet the stranger and you introduce them to everybody. Make sure they have a worthwhile time of the evening. It's been a good evening, memorable evening. Uh, so by the time the party ends, it was time well spent. So the party idea with a new guest. The other, uh, the other example mm -hmm. is you are the captain of a vessel about to get underway. Mm -hmm. And a guest comes up the gangplank for this voyage. And the vessel does get underway. And as it goes along, it's a very rewarding, interesting trip. So that by the time the vessel um, drops anchor or moors, uh, as, a, as a passenger, that passenger has had uh, in the, in the, you know, under the, the command of the, of the captain, a really worthy time. Those ideas, those images uh, are in my mind, whether for, for fiction or nonfiction. And I think there's, of course, there are differences I've experienced. Um, if, I, if my reader is going to include academic, um, you know, teachers, professors, uh, I know I have to I have to be less, um, shall I say, flamboyant okay. um, in some of my in some of my wording. There's, there's just no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 you know, put up those guardrails a little bit. Um, uh, and but in fiction, um, telling that story, that good time party, that voyage, along the way, there have to be little presents for the reader because the story you hope the story is a good story you want to tell a good story but from one or another paragraphs you have to give them something a, sure. an interesting little turn of phrase something to renew interest spark interest okay. so so i just think um the, the the i think there it may be that that more um of us who have have long stints in the college or university classroom uh, could think about our, our writing projects uh, in a narrative um, kind of umbrella uh, for the story. We are storytellers. We better be. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, you know, I, I was just sitting here thinking about how uh, when, when I, I, I had got my bachelor's degree and then master's degree and mm -hmm. the best professors, the absolute best professors, the best teachers I've ever had, um, they were at their heart storytellers. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I had an English teacher in high school who read to us and, you know, you think uh. oh, well, you're, you're, you're high schoolers. Why is a teacher reading to you? She read to us, and this is where I got my horror, uh, my horror jam on. Uh -huh. uh, she read Poe, and uh -huh. she 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 loved it, and she she became the story and she, the way she uh -huh. delivered it, and it was, and and this sounds weird. I I don't I don't mean it the way it's I, I don't mean it that way, but her uh -huh. reading was sensual. Um, yeah. She yeah. loved the words and she wanted you oh. to oh. join in her love yeah. of that story. Yeah. And um, it was always just, it, it was an amazing experience. That's listen. wonderful. What a gift. Yeah. What a yeah. gift. Yes. And that's what got me started down this, this road of becoming a writer and, and got me to where I am today for better or for oh. worse, but you know. Better, um, better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually just wrote a, um, I was working on some, uh, uh, some, some p Facebook posts for next week. And, uh, one of them deals with this idea of, um, you, of course you want to make a life, a, a career out of writing, but that's a very, very small part of being a writer. The larger that's part 
is the people you meet and the relationships you build um, with other writers. It's because we're all kind of like-minded, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so what, I guess what is your favorite book to write and why? Uh, well, I think that I would put first, and, it, and it's not, you know, uh, my book on Mrs. Astor. What would Mrs. Astor do? I'm curious about the uh, title. Yes, um, because and there's a and there's a subtitle to um, the essential guide to the manners and mores um, of the Gilded Age. Well, um, it it it's very carefully researched, mm-hmm. um, um, so that uh, so that accuracy underlies sort of the bedrock of the book. Uh, but I feel that maybe my the, the the secret life I never had as a journalist got to come out. Let me just say, sometimes I pick up the newspaper. Maybe it's you know the major metropolitan newspapers to this day, and on page number fourteen. There's a story about something that a reporter has worked on for a long time. That first paragraph, that sentence is so brilliant. And I just keep reading it over and again. Mm -hmm. Now, I talked to a friend of mine who is a columnist uh, for a major news organization. And she said to me, Cecilia, trust me. Uh, Yes, that person is under deadline, but that that paragraph is the one that took nine hours, and the rest of it was was spun out in the last hour before mm-hmm. deadline. Sure, and I could believe it, but it's it's the admiration for the skill, um, for packing just the right words, just the right rhythm, and just the right and here's the major word flair. Yeah. So in Mrs. Astor, a book about the first Gilded Age, what did they eat? Where did they go? Who did they go with? What did they drink? Uh, a little of that. Um, and um, who did they go with? What were their yachts like? Uh, and so kind of plunging into to, to all of that, uh, when starting a book and And maybe you think this too. You're going to start a project and you think, what do I know and what do I need to know? And you go after what you need to know to round it up. Uh, And so that book, uh, I have to say, researching yachts, sailing yachts and steam yachts of the Gilded Age uh, gave me a, a whole new um, sort of sort of spectrum of, um, of of topics and subtopics. How do they make those top hats? Yeah. Um, what do they do with that felt? And where did they wear them and where did they better have them hung up? So <laughs> these because the, and it, and at what and at what angle? Because yeah. a, a gent better not um, have his hat tilted. Uh, only CADs did that, C-A-D, who were the CADs, uh, and so forth. Oh, interesting. Oh. Huh. Well, it. I love, uh, um, I was on a, a very, er, a very late 1800s yacht at one point, oh. and it was gorgeous. Uh, the bright yeah. work, the wood. And and everything was, of course, there were some ma- there there were some modern upgrades because the U.S. Coast Guard requires that kind of thing. Sure. Um, yeah. But the rest of the yacht was so brilliant. I could just imagine people sitting out on the deck and having having a drink and you know watching the world go by. And uh, it's just it's just mm-hmm. so brilliant. Uh, I, just I love yes. That. yes, yes, just wonderful. Let let me briefly mention another book that I care a lot about. I wrote a book on Jack London. Okay. Jack London. And um, he now, and I'm sorry this has happened. 
um, the Call of the Wild is in a lot of school books for for mostly 11 year old boys. Um, and so he's been, he's come down to us as a writer of animal stories for, you know, young kids. Um, I would say he was really trying to turn around the Gilded Age into a better material age for all Americans. Um, if you're manufacturing so much stuff, make it for everybody. <clears throat> Let everybody enjoy it. Uh, and what's the holdup? So he, he, in his short life of 40 years, he published about 50 books um, and, and felt he was sort of joked that he'd become an industrial worker himself as a writer. Sure. So I just wanted to mention it because I think... I think his his significance as a as an American writer has been has been lost. Yeah, I think so. Too. I, I hope. Think there, well, I think that's true. I think a lot of uh, a lot of our early American authors uh, they get they do they get lost because we have these sensationalized books that came out and kind of took over the 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 uh, um, the megaphone that is you know the literary world. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Yes, yeah. the megaphone. So, is there a book that uh, you you want to write and you haven't written yet? And I don't think I'm going to write it. Oh, <laughs> but I not, but I have it in mind, okay. and I hope somebody does, and maybe you'll do it. Here's something I've learned from the 1930s. Mm -hmm. It's the Depression, mm -hmm. um, soup lines joblessness, um, just the fear that, that America is just sunk. Mm -hmm. On the East Coast, one of the richest women in the world, Marjorie Merriweather Post, okay. heir to the Post cereal fortune and bird's eye frozen vegetables and a lot of others, she opened up a soup kitchen. Hmm. Um, and and just started feeding people who needed food. So that's the East Coast. On the West Coast, Southern California, a very famous woman evangelist, Amy Semple McPherson. Okay. Um, and she she was very well known. Um, she had a a a, a network of congregations, really nationally, but lots of them in Southern California, she opened up soup kitchens. Hmm. She did too. Okay. And in the middle of the country, in Chicago, who else opened up a soup kitchen? Al Capone. Oh, yes. Yes. So I wish somebody would do a book on 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 those three major figures in American culture, well known, coming from altogether different backgrounds and and different ways of life, um, but they all saw the need and they all stepped up. Now that would take some real digging, yeah, uh, into Faz, and and I'm sorry to say. I'm I'm on to my Gilded Age, Val and Roddy Devere mystery, um, uh, Gilded Age series of mystery books, mm -hmm. and and that's that's what I'm up to these days. But I wish somebody would do that Soup Kitchen 1930s book. So I, I'm from South Chicago myself. So uh, the idea uh -huh. of Al Capone would be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and there's some books out. On uh, on more, I mean, I'm I'm handing this over to you, Brian Nowak. Well, um, I, I do uh, write books horror, on Marjorie. So, <laughs> I, I know. But, okay. Well, the Depression is a real horror. That is true. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Whoa. De Depression era serial killer. Now, I'll put it on the back burner. How about cereal with a C? Oh, there we go. Oh, all right. They, yeah, history will judge me for what I've done to Marjorie Post. But anyway. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so you you did mention this a little bit just a second ago, and I wanted to ask you. So you've got this. You've got a very impressive body of work. Uh, what is your most recent uh, recent work? The the book that came out just a couple of months ago, uh, and it's in the 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 Val and Roddy Devere Gilded Age series. The t- and gilded is a word in every one of the of the books. Mm-hmm. Um, um, death in a gilded frame, frame as in picture frame. Uh, and it's set in Newport. It is the second uh, of the series set in Newport, as you know, known as the playground of the rich, the Gilded Age rich. Yes. And and thanks to the Preservation Society of Newport County, um, those quote unquote cottages, and you can say house or cottage. But you are not to say mansion. Man, okay. So the Breakers, Marble House. Is is that a little dog? A this little is, kitty? What? This is this is Chloe. Yes, uh, Chloe has never been on the show before, uh, but she is. Uh, <laughs> she came over here and she wanted up. So. Oh, sweet. I'm I'm a softie for a dog. What can I say? Well, let me tell you that when I was fussing trying to get connected with you, my Frenchie mm-hmm. was lying here at my feet snoring. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Frenchies can snore. Frenchies can snore. Yeah. And they, you know, sometimes bury a look at her. Isn't she a sweetie? Yeah, Your dog. She's, so we've been Labrador people uh, for many, many years. And uh, this, this dog I picked up because uh, she was a rescue from Louisiana and uh it's the colors uh she's she's got a little blue tick in her and oh, uh, and she oh, is oh. absolutely daddy's dog um our last dog was mommy's dog now this one's mine okay yeah. okay funny how they tend to you know to to do that yeah. to do that yeah well our our frenchy is 6 years old and it's before this this crazy popularity that that I think is uh, you know they're uh, they're too popular uh, now and I think it's probably uh, um, people who should be paying attention are not paying attention. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Anyway. Mm. Oh, so let's see where where were we? <laughs> I saw, I saw, <laughs> Sorry. I saw the little furry ears. Yeah. Saw, yeah. She's got great ears. Uh, yeah, like I said, she was, uh, uh, for, for, for those of you listening to this recording, um, uh, ado- rescues, rescues are the way to go. She, uh, was in a, um, in a, uh, uh, oh, no, don't bark. Um, she, oh, little was, woof woof. she was in a, uh, um, in a kennel down in Louisiana and the uh, guy who owned the kennel, if I ever find this person, I'm punching them in the face. Uh, they just walked away. Oh. Uh, and uh, and somebody gained access and freed the dogs, and uh, and this one ended up in uh, in our house. Oh, her, her, blessings, her, blessings. Her, her brother um, is uh, in Warrington, Virginia, and uh, found a home on a farm. And uh, we saw pictures of her brother actually sitting next to the farmer. He made a seat for the dog. And so oh. they plow the plow the fields together. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So okay. no, we were talking about your most recent book. Yes, and set in set in Newport. Um, so uh, a Newport, where a Newport, Rhode Island. Rhode, or, sorry, okay. Newport, because there's several Newports, there are, many yes. Newport, Rhode Island. Okay, uh, with a good deep harbor. Uh, and uh, Newport became, in the late 1700s, uh, the summer resort of a good many southern planters. Okay. And they would leave their rice and cotton plantations, take the, the steamer north to the cool New England breezes, and would build um, uh, fine homes. Now, uh, at the same time, some of the of the New Englanders mm-hmm. would find their way uh, to Newport. Um, 
a, a very well-known scientist named Agassi mm -hmm. uh, spent mm -hmm. summers there and thought about fossils and, and uh, studies. And there were writers, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow mm -hmm. visited Newport and he saw a synagogue, the oldest in America, in the North America, and he wrote a fine poem about it. <laughs> then came the Civil War and um, immediately after, the newly rich from New York began descending on Newport and building in very short order what we would almost call prefab mansions. There was a company in Paris that could build interior silk paneling, um, Jules Allard and Sons and ship these, ship over antiques uh, and crystal chandeliers mm. and all sorts of furnishings and panelings. And meanwhile, uh, workers, in a sense, imported from, from Italy and other parts of Europe, brought over to build such mansions, cottages, houses as, as Marble House, as the elms, as the breakers, and thanks to and the and the same sorts of of huge residences uh, in New York, mm -hmm. much most of which have been demolished, mm -hmm. uh, and the fine hotels, the the Waldorf Astoria, yeah. long gone, but the preservation societies uh, have gone to work, have raised money to preserve these these historic. Um, cottages, they were occupied for about six weeks a year. Mm -hmm. And since I decided to launch a mystery series set in the Gilded Age, and I thought, well, who are my main characters? And they are not simply inventions of, of, of my frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. There is a very wealthy Irish immigrant named John McKay, uh, who came over here as the potato famine, starving time, uh, lurked in Ireland. He worked in the Brooklyn shipyards for a while and went west and he struck it rich, I mean really rich in silver. Oh wow. John McKay. He figures as the father of my main character, Val, Valentine Louise Mackle. Mackle, I changed the name a bit. Um, and the reason she figures is that another woman did grow up as a girl in mining camps in Colorado. And this was Evelyn Walsh. And Evelyn becomes my daughter of the mine, silver mining mogul. Why? Because of all the ladies of the Gilded Age who had um, houses, cottages, mansions. Mm -hmm. It was Evelyn who did not forget where she came from, who said, I sleep on satin sheets now, but I remember sleeping under a bearskin rug in a union suit in the Colorado sub-zero winters when Papa, Papa hunted for gold. Hmm. She remembered the names of her maids, 30 maids in her house. She was the only lady, on record at least, who knew all their names and something about them. So, so because, because of who she was, um, she is Val, Valentine, and she brings a Westerner's angle of vision to this East Coast life. She is now living with the love of her life, Roderick Wyndham uh, Devere, a fifth generation gentlemen. 
Now, of the idle rich, possibly, but he is trained as an attorney, and many of the gentlemen were of the time, First Gilded Age, mm -hmm. because, Brian, they could oversee the trusts and the wills of their family. Instead, Roddy, Roderick, he became interested in cocktails as a young guy. He went down that block in New York from the Barnum Museum and saw Jerry Thomas mixing it up. And he becomes a mixologist himself, privately a consultant to hotels and men's clubs and ocean liners and resorts. Yeah always, always secretive. The bartenders got the credit and his recipes are in the novels, some of them, not too many, but also here's what his law practice is. He defends temperance, he defends saloons and taverns from the temperance crowd. Oh, interesting. The temperance ladies come in, um, and they smash the kegs and the bottles. Um, and some of the tavern owners take them to court. Roddy defends the tavern owners. Huh. Uh, so that's it. So, yes, he is a gentleman of the Gilded Age. Uh, and he cares about tradition. He does. Um, but he and Val fall in love. And they become sleuths when they're trying to shield a good friend from a poisoner who is lurking in the Gilded Age, Newport, 1898 summer. And that starts them as sleuths. That's cool. um, and that started my series. Mm -hmm. A Gilded Death is the first book. What's, and what's the name of the uh, one that just came out? Death in a Gilded Frame. Okay. And what happens, what happens, if I may say, is that, is that when, when Val agrees finally to have her portrait painted, and there were many portrait painters in the summer in Newport, they had commissions, they were scouting commissions. Val agrees to have her portrait painted, and when she enters the gallery to make arrangements, she finds a murder victim and thoughtlessly she picks up the knife, the bloody knife at his feet, and she is seen holding that knife. Hmm. And she's a silver heiress who never quite fits in to society, even though she's got so much money they can't ignore her. And then dun 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 dun. Da, 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 da. Right. <laughs> yes. So uh, where can people find uh, your novels? Where can they well, go? I love it that Amazon is right there yeah. and that lots of mystery readers prefer uh, to have their Kindles. Right. Um, and just tap, uh, tap on, on Amazon and my website. Um, uh, I don't know if you'll put it, put it up. It's, I can certainly put it up. Okay. It is. C E C E books, C E C E books dot com. Okay. Yep. And that takes you right to the books, right to the to Amazon or any special order in any bookstore, Barnes and Noble, they'll get you that book if they don't have it in stock. Um, I would just say, and I'm speaking as somebody who's sitting probably surrounded by about 2,000 books. They're, they're for my research and I need them. But we remember they are wood products. <laughs> and so I've got three or four cords of wood right here <laughs> in this room. Uh, and uh, I'm happy that people... Um, People like to read on their tablets mm -hmm. and can adjust the letter size, the print sure. size, and it's just great. Yeah. Uh, so I find that lots of readers prefer that. Do you read on online sometimes? Uh, well, I do read online, but I have mm -hmm. uh, I have gems like uh, like this one here. This is the uh, 
Synonym Finder by uh, Rodale. Um, this is my, I, th I never put this one back on the shelf because I constantly need it. Uh, I also Good. have behind me the, um, it's the Medicological uh, Encyclopedia Ooh. of Death. Ooh. Yeah. Well, let, let me hold up one of mine. Okay. The Writer's Body Lexicon. The Writer's um, Body Lexicon. Body, okay. Body Lexicon. Body parts, actions, uh, and expectations. I mean, on the, the table of contents, you can look up shoulders, eyes, voices. Mm -hmm. And if I'm st stuck and imagining a new character, mm -hmm. I often will reach for this book. Um, what kind of voice, <laughs> what's their upper lip going to look like? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. All so right. So you can see I have a rifle uh on the well that's a uh, uh that's a um genuine Daisy Red Rider carbine action 200 shot range air rifle. Uh that's oh. the 80th anniversary uh edition up there. Um A Christmas story. Yeah. You are a Christmas story guy. I'm a huge fan. So like I said I I grew up in South Chicago. Uh so you know that story takes place just on the other side of the border from where I grew up. Uh, so I, there's a, you know, a lot of, uh, imagery that I, I associate with, although that was a different generation, but I still saw that growing up. So, yeah, but I, 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 mean, I just, I just love, I mean, I can practically, we watch it, you know, we put it on Turner TV every Christmas every and just let it play, yep. let it run every year. Can't every put year. my arms down. <laughs> <laughs> Can't put my arms down. Well, put your <laughs> arms down when you get to school. Yes, yes. Well, and, and I also have a actual, uh, I have a pistol up here on the wall. You can't see it. Um, but it's uh, it's an old an old school revolver uh, from World War II um, that oh. uh, is actually, it's in a, a caliber that nobody fires anymore and finding ammo for it would be impossible. Um, mm -hmm. You'd have to make your own ammo essentially to fire it. But uh, yeah, and then mm. I, I have a Bakelite telephone. I love these touchstones back. Yes, um, yes. So when you're when you're you're right when you're stuck, um, that's when you you go back and you you grab those things, you read those things, and they make you think. Yeah, bad, you know. Yeah, and and you know one one other point. Uh, my my main character Val mm -hmm. uh, grew up in the in the mining the mining camps in Colorado, mm -hmm. and then. When Papa struck it rich, he moved her, her mother has died in her infancy, moved both of them to Virginia City, Nevada. Okay. Uh, and it was, you know, a.k.a. Silver City. Mm -hmm. uh, and have visited a couple of times, have, have taken, they have a train ride, uh, and, you, and you can go into the mine. There is a mine, into that mine. Uh, you can, you can. You can tour, have um, uh, the silver making process from the crushing the ore mm -hmm. into the into the ingots. So, and of course, from that, uh, you know, when you visit the place where you're going to set a book, sure, you find that there are books published locally there that are not available anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I've got a whole armload of those, and I, and I, I, I go back to them. Um, I wish that that some rich mogul would help Virginia City, not not modernize, but bring those board sidewalks up to date, replace those planks, help help that historic place be what it needs to be it's a wonderful visitor site uh and and it needs some financial help yeah. for uh, for upkeep for maintenance yeah yeah there, i yeah. think there are a lot of places like that which um if they're not preserved they will will vanish yeah they'll be gone yeah. yeah well it's good to hear from you uh that that Johnstown has a museum um, it's a great and that it and that it claims that history. I would like to yeah. see that. And right across yeah. the street from the uh, flood museum, by the way, there's uh, there is a house, and that is one of the last existing examples 
of uh, the Sears catalog houses that you could order oh, from wow. Sears and they would ship to you in parts and then you'd build it. Uh, right. They found it basically inside of another house because another house was built around it. Oh. And uh, when they were tearing it down, somebody was savvy enough to go, oh, wait a minute. This is a Sears house. We need to stop. And uh, cool. it's it's excellently preserved. It's beautiful. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Well, um, mm. you know, I, as a, uh, uh, as a uh, podcaster, presenter, interviewer, writer, I have to say, uh, thank you very much, Celia, for spending time uh, on the show today. I absolutely appreciate it. Brian, thank you. It's, it's been a huge Thank pleasure. you so much, you know, and for all your work at the front end. Oh, Mwah. don't worry about it. That's It's kind of what we do. What a great interview that was. Uh, I honestly don't think enough people give enough time and attention to this idea of what is the Gilded Age of America. A lot of things changed uh, during that time period. And, uh, and I think it's an interesting thing to check out. So uh, definitely get a hold of, uh, of one of Cecilia's books, Cecilia uh, Tishi, and check them out because uh, I, I think they're just amazing. They're gorgeous. The artwork's lovely. The, the subject matter's amazing. Now, uh, pay, uh, pay close attention. Uh, I'm very, very soon going to have another interview coming up. And uh, it, it's very cool. I, I get all these great authors on here to, to talk about what they've got going on. Um, next, I'm going to have a military fiction author, Bruce Farmer, who is going to uh, talk about his latest novels. He actually has one released and he's got one just coming out right now. So that'll be kind of a fun conversation. We'll talk a little bit about what his attraction was to this military history and or military fiction uh, kind of that thriller genre, the spy kind of thing. I <clears throat> I don't personally write it as a topic, but I do read books on occasion that that are kind of that uh, that exciting, adrenaline filled, sniper, military intrigue sort of thing. Every book is a mystery uh, if you think about it, because we open up our books and uh, we don't know how it's going to end until we get to read it. So. Very exciting uh, to, to get to bring on uh, Dr. Farmer uh, to talk about his work. So, on behalf of All Things Writing, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this week's guest was Cecilia Tishi. Remember to hit up that link. Go see her books. Go check out what she's got on uh, uh, on uh, on order uh, available for you to read. I'm definitely going to check out the, the book uh, that contains all the recipes to the drinks of the Gilded Age, because uh, as you heard us talk about, that was an interesting time period where things changed. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. This is All Things Writing. Brian the Writer, signing off. This has been another amazing episode of All Things Writing. If you heard something that got your wheels spinning, check out the links in the show notes. Also, please follow the show and remember to leave those reviews. Those simple acts of kindness mean the world to us. Hop on over to briannowak.com, and that is Brian with a Y, and check out my latest novels. I'm on Amazon or wherever you buy your ebooks. And as a reminder, the music you heard on the show today was used under license from the artist Ryan Ancona. Thanks for listening to the show and have a blessed day.